vamos pa'l frente, con amor es lo que hay. Arriba mi gente no es diferente, ser humano ya verás. Arriba mi gente Welcome to 10 Years of DACA in Story and Song, a special Motors Theater performance from the Buell Public Media Center at Rocky Mountain PBS. I am your host, Armando Peniche. 10 years ago, President Obama signed an executive order to create the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, known as DACA. It was created to provide a two-year period of deferred deportation, a work permit, and increased opportunity for higher education to children brought to this country without documentation. During the last 10 years, young undocumented people took advantage of this reprieve from threats of deportation to become doctors and nurses protecting us from COVID, teachers instructing our children, and business owners contributing to the economy of our country. MODIS is honoring this 10th year anniversary by sharing autobiographical monologues of young leaders with DACA, so you can know more about the hopes and dreams of your undocumented neighbors. Because regardless of your perspective on immigration, it is important we understand the impact on the families caught in the crosshairs of U.S. immigration policy. Woven between the monologues, you will hear a musical response to each story. We hope when you hear these songs that you know they are not simply for the monologist, but to support each of us in our own aspirations for liberty and justice. And now, Cristian Solano Cordova reading his autobiographical monologue entitled The Meaning of Courage. When I was my baby sister's age, 14 years old this year, I didn't have many worries. And it's funny because my baby sister, the Nayi, she's an American citizen, so it should be easier for her, but it's not. It's not right now because the people she loves most in this whole entire world, my mom, our other sister, Beba, and I, we're all undocumented. And when we're threatened, She's threatened. So my baby sister was forced to bear the burden of attacks on immigrants under the Trump administration. I remember election night 2016. My mom and I were in complete shock trying to absorb what had just happened to the country, trying to strategize about how to handle certain possibilities. I remember frantically Googling, what happens to a US citizen child if an undocumented parent is deported? My dad died young, so I needed to assure myself that if my mom were deported, I could get custody of the Nai, who at the time was only eight. But then, of course, what would happen if both Beba and I were deported? My mom and I totally lost track of time during our election night panic. So when hours later I came downstairs, I was surprised to find my baby sister, the Nai, wide awake, sitting in a corner by herself, crying red-faced, with puffy eyes. With my dad gone, I've always had to be the big brother, or rather father figure, since our mom was always working. I helped the with her homework. We read each other bedtime stories. We play games. I try to answer those unanswerable kinds of kid questions and comfort her when she's scared. But I wasn't used to trying to comfort her when, in reality, I needed so much comforting myself. I remember tilting her chin, glistening with streams of tears toward me, looking into those deep brown eyes and trying my best to give her soothing answers to difficult questions. Just repeating, don't cry, baby, don't cry. It's gonna be okay, I promise. It's gonna be okay. Listen, why would you be deported? Do you even know what that word means? You shouldn't have to. But listen to me. You are an American citizen. You will never be deported. And you're right. I'm not a citizen, but I've got DACA. They can't deport me. And I know mom is not a citizen and she doesn't have DACA, but she's gonna be okay. She's lived here for decades. She's not going anywhere. Baby, don't cry. Please. I promise, whatever happens, we'll be together. Always. 
I'll be there to put band-aids on your scraped knees. I'll be there for you to help you with your school projects. <laughs> yes, we're gonna finish reading Harry Potter together. And I'll be by your side when you need help applying for college. I'll be there for you when you fall in love for your first time, when your heart is broken. And I'll walk you down the aisle one day. It really doesn't matter where, as long as we're together. <laughs> and yes, of course the puppy's coming with us if we go. We'll lose part of this family too, I'll have you know. Yeah, that's a dimply smile I like to see. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. At least, that's what I told her. I did my best to offer her what I wanted to hear, what I wanted to believe, both for her and our entire family. Because how do you talk to a child about being taken away from their parent or siblings without terrorizing them, without stripping them of their innocence? And with each day of the Trump administration, the increased deportations of parents like my mom, the attempts to end the DACA program that protects me and my sister Beba, the willingness to end rules that limit how long children can be detained, and even threats to strip children like the Nai of their citizenship. With all these mounting threats, it felt increasingly cruel for me to offer my baby sister a fairy tale, when in reality, she needed great strength to overcome great threats. So today, I offer her and you another story and this story won't kiss it and make it all better, but I'm hoping it'll help us stay strong regardless of any challenges that we might face. I was three years old and my sister Beba was just one when we crossed the border with our mom. We walked together with a group of 10, 15 people. We walked for hours and hours at night in the middle of the desert. I remember we were out in the middle of nowhere following a dim silver light I imagined we followed it because it meant we were going the right way, some shining city in the distance. We finally got to a raised road lined with street lamps and to avoid walking over the street and potentially being seen, we crossed through a drainage tunnel under the road. Mom had me walk through the tunnel in front of her and she crawled behind with my sister in her shawl. And Peppa and I we were wearing those little kids light up shoes everybody was going crazy over that year. Mom had saved up a lot of money to buy them because we were going to be seeing our dad after a year of him being in the U.S. on his own, and she wanted us to look our best. And those shoes, they were actually super helpful in that drainage tunnel, helping to light the way for Mom and all the other people crawling through on their hands and knees. But of course, in the dead of night, in the middle of the desert, they were a dead giveaway. When we were finally able to see the moonlight at the end of the tunnel and catch a whiff of fresh air, the girl this urgently requested that my mom take off my shoes. There's a border patrol car parked outside, he whispered. The drainage tunnel emptied out right next to a gas station where the border patrol car was parked. The officers were inside, we assumed, so we waited for a while, hoping they'd return to their car and drive away. But nobody was coming out, and for some reason, the Coyotes grew impatient and abruptly told everybody to move. And in the chaos, everybody immediately scrambled, crawling behind tall grass on their hands and knees as their Coyotes gave us voiceless commands with their fingers on their lips and pointing to the ground. But the ground was covered in massive cactus thorns, and I didn't have any shoes. And while everyone crawled, my mom stood up, carrying both Beba and me in her arms, and she just started walking. And at first, at first I thought she was giving up because we would surely be seen. I mean, everybody else was still crawling on the ground, but she stood up tall and walked with a defiant pep in her step as if she belonged right there where she stood. And that's when I realized she hadn't given up. She just had faith that walking quickly and quietly was her best strategy to protect us. She was resolved that somehow, somewhere, we would find a place to call home, somewhere we could thrive. And I have never forgotten the look on my mom's face as she walked out into the darkness of an unknown country. 
That is when I first learned that the real meaning of courage is not to pretend to be immune from fear, but rather to calmly and steadily take action in spite of it. Our former president and his followers, they might try to caricature my little three-year-old self as a diseased, toddler, criminal, murderer, rapist, gang member in the making. They might try to scare people who don't know any undocumented immigrants into thinking that my mother carrying her children to safety is nothing less than an invasion. But Beba and I, we grew up beloved by our friends, our neighbors. We grew up to be strong members of our communities. We both went to college and I even became student body president of my university. I'm not part of some invading army fighting against America, but like many of you, I'm fighting for the American ideals I know we can live up to. They may want to take away my baby sister's right to citizenship, but I remain hopeful that maybe the Nai or some other young woman listening to my story might be our future president and lead us to a future where we actually live up to those ideals to truly have liberty and justice for all. But that reality is gonna take a lot of hard work and not just on my part or on the part of the immigrant community, but hard work on your part too. Every single one of you. As Anne Frank once wrote in her famous diary, how wonderful it is no one need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Just for a moment, take a walk in my shoes, feel the weight of my burden, see the world as I do. Maybe then we'll find a way to live a life where each can say, I respect who you are. to refrain from any judgment and my pain and hold your story for a while if you could just for a moment be the son of a mom and dad be the fruit of their struggle them gave you all they have. Watch your sister sit and cry for fear she has to say goodbye to all she loves and she knows. I say don't worry we'll survive. Mama's shown us how to thrive. Just need your courage for a while. For un momento, caminar en mi camino, sentir el peso de mi carga y ver el mundo como yo. Así vamos a encontrar la manera de hablar y decir: Yo te respeto. Toma un momento sin rencor, sin todo el juicio y el dolor, ten mi historia por un tiempo. If you could just for a moment, let me walk in your shoes, feel the weight of your burden. life that you do neighbor then I'll understand despite our difference shake your hand and now respond
respect who you are I take this moment to refrain from any judgment and my pain and hold your story for a while If you could just for a moment take a walk in my Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Christian. And now, modus monologuist Alejandro Fuentes Mena reading his autobiographical monologue entitled, Deport Me. I was just a kid when I realized what being undocumented meant. At age eight, I started going to work with my dad so I could help him rebuild the entire outside of other people's homes, all the while not having a home of our own. I would help my dad research what to charge and work out all the math. For example, I would discover that for one given job, Contractors would charge $20,000. My dad had been screwed over so many times that he would only charge about $15,000. Clients would see his strength in Spanish, his lack of English and documented status, and give him about $10,000. And that is who my father believed he was. Half the man I thought he was. Half the value of any other. I witnessed as my mother would leave for an entire weekend, 72 hours, to take care of someone else's family. She was lured with the promise of being paid over $300 for the weekend, but she would come back with only $100 in her pocket. $100? She saw that as a blessing. $100? I saw that as an attack on my family. All those rich families saw little value in everything my mom did for them. They would take her away only to use her and spit her out. The money they paid her was barely enough to cover for the food on the table. It didn't cover the worry my mom had because she couldn't be home to take care of us when we were sick. Help us with our homework. Comfort us when we came home to an empty house. A hundred dollars for a whole weekend away from her family. Like she was worthless. But don't you understand that she was priceless to me? Well, spending my weekends without my mom as she cared for other people's children and spending those weekends working for my dad for free so he wouldn't lose money for the privilege of building a home for someone else's family and witnessing this over and over and over again, I began to think that maybe I wasn't worth much either. Despite the fact that I had been recognized at school as gifted and talented, 
despite the fact that I was a math whiz and learned English, a completely unknown language in less than a year, and that I was an engaged student, despite the fact that I was a precocious worship leader at my church, I let those weekends of feeling worthless affect me. I began making jokes rather than making plans for my future. Playing games rather than paying attention. Chasing girls rather than chasing my dreams. And like all self-fulfilling prophecies, I got to the point where my grades reflected exactly what this society said my parents and I were worth. half-priced human beings. But luckily, I had a teacher named Ms. Kovacic who worked hard to remind me of my value and convince me that what this society was telling me and my family was wrong. With her support, and that of many others, I got myself out of that pit of self-deprecation, past the insecurities, past the hate, past the negativity, past that half version of me into a good college and into a position where I am now an educator who teaches math. And like my mentors, I teach young children their value because all children are valuable just as you and I are valuable. As a teacher, I can't help myself. Let me take you out of school for a few moments. I hope you're good with that. <laughs> Let's start off with a little math lesson. My father is one man, one of the hardest workers I know. My mother is one woman, one of the strongest and most compassionate individuals in my life. My sister is one daughter, a brat, <laughs> but a lovable one and an American citizen, and I am one son, half of this country and half of Chile, and we are four whole beautiful gifts, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, not the half-priced individuals that this country has attempted to make us. Moving to applied math and economics. If this country continues to deport the undocumented community, it is missing out on courageous, strong, intelligent, family loving, hard working people of great value. And that is not only our loss, it's your loss to miss out on us. Not to mention the billions in taxes that we bring in every single year, which by the way is billions more than large corporations are paying. Lastly, moving beyond math to ethics. Paying an undocumented person half the value for their life's work Extracting all you can get from them to build your homes and take care of your children and then deporting them as if they had not brought value. It's not just mathematically flawed. It's an American math story problem gone wrong. It is criminal to treat us as subservient and less desirable. 
am living in this country undocumented, teaching your children, supporting them, engaging their minds in math and in their dreams. I am 100% here and 100% committed to this country in which I was raised, this country that constantly seeks to spit me out. Lose me, and you lose my value. Not just the money I pay in taxes and the money I pay into Social Security, which I will never be able to benefit from, but you lose my ability to inspire, connect, and engage. You lose my ability to bring an impact. And you lose the knowledge that I bring to my students who are your children. This country would be foolish to lose me. Deport me! Deport me. But in the end, it's your loss.
And now, Modus Monologuist Tanya Chaitis reading her autobiographical monologue entitled, Listen to Your Heart. Hi, everyone. So when I think about DACA, I actually think about the fact that I became a community organizer at the height of the undocumented and unafraid movement pre-DACA. I even participated in civil disobedience, where many cities across the nation were doing the same. And we do believe that that's what led to DACA. We sort of motivated the administration to provide something for us. But you know, I never thought that 10 years later I would still be fighting for DACA. So today I'm dedicating my monologue to all the organizers who have been in this struggle for longer than I have for immigrant rights, for all the youth who never qualified for DACA and the new youth who can't have their applications processed, and for our future generations who are trying to figure out what this means for a nation that we thought was filled with equity and opportunity. My monologue is titled, Listen to Your Heart. I often hear that the only way to get people to care about my struggles as an undocumented woman is to ask them to imagine me as their daughter or their sister. But I have my own family, and my mere humanity deserves respect. I was taught at school in this country that my contributions to society are all that should matter. So I've done everything in my power to be at the top of my class, get into a good college, volunteer, work hard, pay taxes, to prove I'm worthy. And I am worthy, with or without all that effort, even though I often get treated quite literally like an alien or criminal, simply because I don't have an official document calling me a citizen. I also want you to know that I am proud of my Mexican identity, even though it took me two decades to embrace it. From ages five to 18, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona a place where an anti-immigrant sheriff named Joe Arpaio ruled. He put undocumented Mexican immigrants in chain gang shackles, making the men wear pink underwear to humiliate them. He literally celebrated spending less money on his inmates than on his dog, and this was somehow acceptable. I grew up constantly striving to prove that I wasn't dirty, lazy, criminal, or shameful. That I wasn't worth less than a dog. I now finally have a sense of my own value. So to feel my life under attack and have most people do nothing in response, it's as if my humanity doesn't matter. And that baffles me. It's inconceivable that the very ground under my feet is falling away and I could be deported, put into a detention center, separated from my family, lose my job, my mortgage, and all I've built. And yet somehow you, my friends, neighbors, people at the coffee shop, the grocery store, maybe you listening to my story right now might not see my situation as urgent enough to get up and do something about it. My entire community of documented and undocumented people is under attack everywhere, left and right, day after day, and it seems you think you've done your job simply by liking my article on Facebook? Sad crying face, maybe even angry face. People think they've done enough by staying caught up on the news so they have something to lament at the dinner table? My life is not a talking point. My life is not something to uplift a liberal agenda and don't you dare pity me or send me your prayers. Do something. Call your senator or your immigrant phobic family. 
Show up at an immigrant rights meeting because every day that you don't take action is another day the status quo prevails. And the status quo is painful, even if I still have my family intact, because it hurts physically, emotionally, mentally, that you don't care enough to get up and do something, give your time and effort to help your fellow human beings. Because while you are going about your business as usual, trying to keep up with work deadlines, health goals, reflecting on your next gratitude post, those of us on the front lines of anti-immigrant attacks are fighting against the limited hours in a day because there's never enough time to work our 60 hour a week jobs and go to protest after protest, plan meetings, events, fundraisers, and teach-ins, pouring our energy from what quickly becomes an empty cup. But somehow, at the same time, it's still the job of the undocumented community to educate citizens on how our life depends on your voice, your vote, your money, and your willingness to show up. It's not like we enjoy the fact that we need you, but we do. And I am exhausted from pulling your weight and begging you to act like a citizen in a democracy. And because most people aren't pulling their weight, my mental health is suffering. I need rest too. But right now, I'm afraid that if I don't go to that extra meeting, if I don't share that petition, if I don't convince everyone that this is urgent, then another family will get deported, sometimes sent to their death, and another family will be torn apart. You see, it's urgent for us all the time. And someplace, deep inside, you must know it's urgent, too. You must. So please, just for a moment, pause, breathe. Can you hear my words? I am afraid. I am afraid that in the end, no matter how much I've fought for others, I won't be able to save my own family from deportation. Have you seen the pictures from our borders? Innocent families with young children and elders, tear gassed, whipped for seeking refuge. Do you know what is happening across the country? Hardworking immigrants, good parents just like mine, locked away like criminals in detention centers. Young children, separated from their parents in these terrible tent camps are exposed to abuse and dying from untreated infections. Do you see a war? Do you see at least a semblance to concentration camps? Can you feel your own heart telling you it is urgent. Please listen to your heart. Not just for me or for the undocumented community, but for your own humanity too. Please, it's urgent. Thank you, Tanya Chaitis. It is a privilege to share the stage with you and all of the other undocumented criminologists. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing international award-winning slam poet, Dominique Cristina. 
She holds five National Poetry Slam titles in four years. Her work is greatly influenced by her family's legacy in the civil rights movement. Her aunt, Carlotta Walsh Lanier, was one of nine students to desegregate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and is a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient. She created a poem you're about to hear in honor of Motors Theater's Undocu America monologists and in recognition of the 10th anniversary of DACA. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, a story in three-part harmony. Part one, you don't know her, but she is family. Charlotte, all bright green chanclas and buck teeth. Her mother left Mexico when she was two years old. She doesn't remember that. First thing she does remember is being in a Head Start preschool program in El Paso, Texas, and she couldn't speak a lick of English. A blonde girl named Mariah pulled her hair and asked her why she didn't talk. Charlotte was waiting to speak when her English was perfect. When the words were a flight of stairs, anybody could climb. English was so shifty. The rules didn't abide by themselves. It sat clumsily in her mouth until the summer before her fifth grade year. That's when the Boys and Girls Club took her to a Shakespeare festival. And she heard things like double, double toil and trouble. And she heard things like life is but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. And something stood up in her. She didn't understand the words, but she heard the music in it. What made it even more delicious was the other kids at the festival didn't seem to know what the words meant either. She wasn't alone in that. It was perfect. She decided the words were meant to be investigated. It sounded like an invitation. It sounded like a welcome sign above the door. She was a junior in high school when she found out she was undocumented, sitting in a guidance counselor's office talking about majoring in literature in college when the woman said illegal. That's when English did what it sometimes does. You know, it breaks the world on your head with one tiny word, illegal, undocumented. Words that sound like soldiers coming, words that kick your door down. Charlotte lived in El Paso her whole life, got her driver's license the year before, worked afternoons and weekends at a coffee shop. What was illegal about that? You don't know her, but she is family, Charlotte. She is undocumented. This country is the only country she knows. In sixth grade, she won a Good Citizen Award. Irony, her mommy put it in a frame and hung it in the hallway in the sixth grade. She was a good citizen. And yet she has no real path to citizenship. Part two, you don't know him, but he is family. Emilio, Ecuadorian boy swinging from the moon. Strangers are a series of gestures because English is not easy. It slides over everything. It gets stuck in your teeth. His parents came to California when he was 18 months old, unburdened by fear. They leapt. Courage is the thing you use when the dream is louder than the risk. It ain't no poem. Metaphors won't tell you about the blisters or the waiting. The mosquitoes, the dirty water, the heat, the cold, or the humiliation of being unwelcome in a place you all but died to get to. Emilio is striped shorts and discount shoes, postcards from his abuela who talks of back pain and things growing in her garden. He likes the beach and soccer. His first kiss was with a girl named Claudia at his senior prom in San Diego. He had a shine that night. He wore a red bow tie and Claudia pinned her hair back with a feather and red beads, exquisite and free. The following Monday, Emilio filled out a FAFSA form for college and was told he didn't qualify for federal loans because he was undocumented. And all the shine from the weekend before fell from him. 
Home isn't always what we think it is. Emilio's parents understood that. When they left Ecuador to dream out loud and dreams are important, they understood that. You'll walk the desert for them. You'll brave the deep. You'll hear that there is a place where dreams can become themselves, so you'll brave the deep. You'll go right out into it if it means tomorrow has a promise. Emilio was tied to his mother's back when they left what home they knew, looking for a better meaning of that word. He saw an old Polaroid once, tucked away in his mother's closet, a picture of his parents covered in dirt, a hunger in his father's eyes, fear in his mother's, exhaustion clinging to them both. And there he was, an infant strapped to his mother's back the day they reached the border. Yeah, dreams are important and insistent. Emilio's entire life is evidence of that, the private dialogue between the dream and the dreamer is primal and urgent, the desert leviathan like his parents' dreams. Like his parents' dreams. Part three, you should know them. They are family, blood-stitched and war-walloped all outlawed by their mothers, their fathers, their port of call. Perhaps you don't know what it takes to muscle through the dark, scalpeled against uncertainty, meaning it because you heard there was light on the other side, and that light sounds like a life. Perhaps you don't know the bruise in being made to feel unwelcome all your life. Politicians create orphans with policy and call it homeland security. I could talk to you about the insult of denying belonging to a person desperate for it, but you know that already. If your heart works, you know that. 10 years ago, a policy was implemented by the first black man to become president in this country, but the work has always been ours to mean. So this is an invitation to know your family, the ones you haven't met yet, the ones whose predecessors rode the night looking for home. They've been here all this time still waiting for the only home they've ever known to reach back for them and tell them finally with no caveat, no guillotined threats of deportation, just waiting for home to reach back for them and tell them finally, meaning it. My name, it is Maria, my daughter is a dreamer, she says that she is worried that she will have to leave, when I was only 20, I crossed the burning border. I came to find a good life and brought my daughter here. When I came to America, I hoped life would be better for me and for my daughter. And here I worked for you. I harvested the peaches in Northern California and then in Colorado, my family and me. This land was made by dreamers and 
children of those dreamers we came here for democracy and hope now all we have is hope my husband is a good man he is no raping criminal his hands are rough and scarred now from digging in the earth my daughter loves her father and he was always gentle he too came from helisco to find what freedoms were but will you send her back now to live in fear and terror she is our only daughter whose dreams have been our vow we worked to pay our way here we gave our youth and promise and in return you force us to go back to the wall this land was made by dreamers and children of those dreamers we came here for democracy and hope now all we have is hope my It is Maria My daughter is a dreamer She says that she is worried that she will have to leave And now Modus Monologus Rey de Cel Salvidres Rodriguez reading his autobiographical monologue entitled, Born for the Light. Imagine living in a cold, lonely world where you cannot see anything around you but dark shadows moving in distance. There is no hope, no future, nothing to plan ahead. You have nightmares of being taken from the family and sent to exile. You have learned to think of yourself as an illegal, something shameful, something that doesn't belong. And you fear you're the only one. Your fellow classmates are talking, laughing, praying for their life, and applying for colleges. You don't have a social security number. You cannot apply. You seek guidance, help. I'm a good student. I want to continue into college. I promise I will work hard. I have overcome the challenge of being deaf, and now I have a dream. But the guidance counselor interrupts to silence you. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. You are an illegal. You try to follow as your friend continues to college, but with no option of financial aid, no scholarship available, you don't even have enough money for one semester. So you drop out. You cannot tell your friends you're undocumented. So you lie and tell them you're not ready for college. You get off social media, so hard to see the happy faces, the talk of a career and classes. Little by little, you slowly disappear and should they forget about you. All your life you try to be good, to stay out of trouble, and to make your parents proud. You have resisted joining a gang, even though they promised you the loneliness will end if you just join them. But now you have to buy a social security number on the black market to, to get a job. You are becoming what you fear. Your body is being poisoned from the last you must tell people to protect and survive yourself. 
It is trying to destroy you from the inside. There is no escape. You are illegal. No matter how hard you work, you are still illegal. A prisoner in the free world, you are still illegal. You feel the heavy weight of change. Are you a criminal or a slave? For you, being undocumented is a curse. You hate being Mexican. You hate your family. And most of all, you hate yourself. And every day that your dream die, the chains get heavier and heavier. You cannot feel yourself anymore. When you accident accidentally injure your hand at the construction site where you work, you are surprised to feel pain. It has been so long since you felt anything. At nine, you pour rubbing alcohol into wounds on your hand and watch yourself burn. You feel less lonely with your body on fire than the numb in the cold. And then you decide you will kill yourself. But that thought cuts so deep, the pain you will cause your mother, your father, some light at the bottom of your system say you cannot die. Maybe your life is over, but your siblings are American citizens. You will help them get help them study, help them get a driver license, help them get into college. Everything you can have. There is some light. You become one of the many undocumented laborers living to support the dreams of another. And then your mother calls. Obama has given you papers. Obama has created DACA. How can the worst of a president who has never met, who has never met you, save your life? I signed up for DACA in college the same week. I found beautiful people at the college, members of Dreaming United. I was no longer alone, but surrounded by other students who walked the same path as me. They showed me the scars and marks from the chain. I saw the tears and motivation in their eyes. I saw them graduating, becoming doctors, lawyers, educators, teachers, community organizers, and becoming my friends. I started fighting for institutional change, creating student organizations on campus, marching on the streets. I ran for student government, and I, an undocumented, legally deaf, first-generation college student, I won. And now, after eight long years, I have finally graduated with my bachelor's. And I'm in, I'm in graduate school, getting my master's degree in higher education. I hope one day to support other fourth generation college students to achieve their higher education dreams. I look down with the chance once where I see a torch in my hand. I'm not an illegal, I'm not. That was the lie. The lie that created all the lies that put me into the darkness. I'm not an illegal, my name. Radecel, it has an ancestral root del Rey del Sol, or King of the Sun. I was made for the light. I'm a warrior of light. And a human being is illegal in these stolen lands. Listen, you who are afraid, I know your fear. You have no hope, who are so deep in hiding that you have lost even yourself. You can win the battle with the shadows. The nightmares can stop and go away. Your arms were not meant to be for shame, but for freedom, for joy, and to dream again. Your voices were not meant to be silent, but to stand up and fight back. On behalf of my family, my community, my parents, my siblings, and myself, I stand in the full light and call out my name, Serre de Cel Salvador Rodriguez. I'm undocumented, unashamed, unafraid, and unapologetic. Welcome to my brilliant, shiny, beautiful life. Thank you. Arriba mi gente, vamos pa'l frente, con amor es lo que hay. Arriba mi gente, no es diferente, ser humano ya verás. Arriba mi gente, sigamos al frente, con nuestra identidad. Que mi gente no es diferente, por ser de otro lugar. Thank you. That concludes Motors Theaters and Rocky Mountain Public Media's special program recognizing the 10th anniversary of DACA. Please keep sharing these stories so that regardless of your perspective on immigration, everyone knows more about the people whose lives are at stake in immigration debates. 
Thank you. Lado a lado seguimos pelando por la justicia. Mano a mano vamos avanzando. Quiero vivir en paz. Pero amigo, yo no puedo solo. Nos tenemos que apoyar. Juntos se puede con muchos colores crear comunidad. Yo soy como tú. Quiero amor y libertad. Yeah, I'm just like you. Mi sangre es igual. cayendo sin papel sin documento que tú no sabes que estamos huyendo de hambre y violencia dime que tú no harías lo mismo por salvar a tu familia no se olviden que Estados Unidos divididos caerán yo soy como tú preciso seguridad y yeah, I'm just like you mis hijos son igual y yeah, I'm just like you ilegal no buena razón para hacerme deportar 